Welcome back to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio podcast and television show. I'm your host, Life Coach Marina Young, and sitting in the guest chair today is Scout Sobel. She is the author of The Emotional Entrepreneur, and we are going to be having a very interesting conversation today on mental health. Um, um, being, you know, healthy mental health as an entrepreneur. We're going to talk about Scott's journey um, uh, with her mental health issues. So yeah, it's going to be a power packed conversation. So make sure you stay tuned. um, Even if you have mental health issues, if you're an entrepreneur, um, uh, to just understand about how our emotions guide us in everyday life. Welcome, Scout. Thank you so much for having me. I am honored and I'm really excited to jump into all things mental health and entrepreneurship. Yes, awesome. I um, um, can't wait to jump into. So let me um, give you a bio on Scout. Um, Scout experienced her first, first depressive episode at the age of 14 and was formally diagnosed with bipolar disorder at the age of 20. Living with a mental illness brought on an onslaught of symptoms, anxiety, hypomania, depression, catonia, psychosis, suicidal ideation. Her perception of her life weighed down on her so poignantly that she dropped out of college, could not hold down a job or internship, was hospitalized, experimented with a medley of prescription medications and went through two outpatient programs. One day her husband, he was then her boyfriend, looked at her lovingly and said, I don't care if you're depressed. If you're depressed and hopeful, I can be in this relationship. But if you're depressed and hopeless, I can't be with you. I understand where he's coming from. And that was the moment Scout said her life changed. She started infusing her life with hope and began to take radical responsibility for her emotional state. And after an intense self-development work with support groups and holistic healing modalities and prayer and routines and physical wellness, she found entrepreneurship. Through entrepreneurship, she learned to unconditionally love her life through the pain, challenges, and celebrations. She learned that she wanted to be here. Today, Scout is the founder and CEO of Scout's Agency, a female-focused PR agency that specializes in getting women as guests on a podcast. Her debate, her debut book, The Emotional Entrepreneur, pro- provides the mindset and emotional tools she learned from managing her mental illness that has helped her succeed in business. Wow, yes. So this was a little long bio, but I read it all because everything here was important to our conversation. So. Um, I want to start off with um, something you say in your book, The Emotional Entrepreneur. You say that our emotions are our guiding superpowers when it comes to building a business of your dreams. How did your emotions guide you to become an entrepreneur? You know, bridge for us the, um, I know your, your bio, you know, focused on your journey a little bit from 20 years old to become an entrepreneur. But fill in our gaps um, uh, for what the listeners want to know that how you did it. What exactly did you have to to bind up in order to do it? <laughs> yes. So very shortly after I was diagnosed, uh, my husband said that couple sentences that changed my life. And I started infusing hope into my days, which beautifully led me to faith. And through that process, Um, showing up to support groups, you know, writing gratitude, my gratitude list in my journal every single morning, reading every self-help book Barnes and Noble had to offer, which was a very weird aisle to walk down 10 years ago. Believe me, it was not trendy. Um, I started getting, you know, garnering up some strength to hold some responsibility and start actually showing up in the world. So I was a part-time barista And I had enrolled in a community college class to kind of dip my toes back into the real world. And I was sitting with my friend at a coffee shop and we were looking through an indie magazine. I love fashion magazines. I always have. And I just looked at her and I asked, do you want to start a magazine with me? 
And she said, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, we were going to print it at Kinko's and pass it out to our friends for free. This was going to be a borderline arts and crafts project. And something in my mind just flipped. And all of a sudden I went home, I got the Instagram handle, the domain, I researched printers in the area. And then I had set up, you know, five appointments with all the best printers in a 50 mile vicinity. And then I went to go see them and then they quoted me $10,000. And I said, I have to find $10,000. And I started a Kickstarter campaign and, you know, fast forward our second issue was picked up by a national distributor and sold in newsstands across the country. I was 22 at the time. And the third issue had musician Halsey on the cover. And I woke up to an email from Barnes and Noble asking if they could, uh, if they could distribute my magazine as well. And so in that three issue process of running that magazine, I went from the girl that had to pull herself out of bed. Like I was walking through quicksand to to go to my job as a gelato scooper, to go to my internship that wasn't paying me anything. I couldn't deal with responsibility. I became the girl that overfunctioned. I became the girl that went the extra mile in such a short time because I found that entrepreneurship, there was two things that I felt so at home in. One, bipolar disorder has high highs, low lows. Entrepreneurship, high highs, low lows. And so my mind could really understand the emotional pattern behind it. And two, I was unable to show up for the responsibilities in my life because I always had a psychiatrist note that could write me out. I always had an out, you know, I didn't have to go to the friend's birthday party because I had a mental illness and all my friends would understand or, you know, try to understand, et cetera. And so I really used my mental illness as a crutch to avoid responsibility and avoid showing up in my life in the ways that I really needed to. But when it came to entrepreneurship, there was no note a psychiatrist could write out because I couldn't tap out. It was me. If I tapped out, the whole thing fell apart. So it was almost this contradictory paradox of I had to have all the responsibility on my shoulders in order for me to show up. It had to be completely mine uh, on every aspect to what time do I wake up to? How many calls do I have a day to? How many hours a week am I going to work on this? And so I found in the beginning of entrepreneurship that I showed up because I had the freedom to create what I wanted to create. And I couldn't call in sick. That didn't work anymore. There was no one to kind of send the note to, send the doctor's note to. And so those two combinations started my entrepreneurial path. Wow. I love that story. I'm going to circle back to a couple of things. One, that's exactly the way I started my life coaching business. Um, I was reading a magazine one day and I saw this word life coach and I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. And I was listening to a podcast the other day and this woman said she was around 22 as well. Um, I had no experience, was considered a failure. Well, she wasn't a failure. She was successful actually in a fashion magazine as well. And one day she saw this thing called life coach and she figured that, you know, she wanted to become a life coach. And she says, well, nobody would hire her as a life coach because she's young and, uh, you know, you can't be telling people what to do. But she went on to almost identical as you to become very successful in what she is doing now. Um, uh, and I believe that when something grabs you that well, that 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 strongly and you just know that is God with your purpose. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's the first thing. I believe that um, the reason it grabbed you is because that's what you're here to do, number one. Oh, and number two, right. And number two, what I wanna, what I wanna circle back to, I also believe that happiness is working towards a goal. And there is no better goal than when you're working for yourself and you're trying to grow your business. The reason that people are really unhappy is because they're going to work and they're working for their boss or they're working for the company and they don't see just a paycheck. But when you're working for yourself and you've got these big dreams and goals of becoming rich, because why else would you start it, right? You're becoming rich, you're becoming successful. It is, it is, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it puts you on that happiness chart. You know how many times, you know, I do this, what I do right now, right? And um, um, it is my purpose. And I absolutely love it. I love, enjoy it. I love what I do. 
and um, it makes me happy. And the fact that every time that I show up for an interview or every time that I show up here, there's a possibility that, you know, that's the one that would be the one, you know what I mean? Or someone will see it and someone will say, hey, let's partner. It is the hope. And that's exactly what your boyfriend husband was saying, right? Hope is a very important thing. So I like the fact that um, both of those things. Um, and I also like the fact that you're talking about that you were using the doctor's notes as a cop out in life, right? A lot of people do that. They lead with their illnesses. They lead with, it doesn't even have to be mental illness. It could be a physical illness and they lead with that. Oh, I can't do this because of this or whatever. And it's a cop out because we know as being in the inspirational space that people, <laughs> um, they defy yeah, odds just, all the time. Right, yeah, they defy odds and uh, you know do amazing things with no hands and no legs and no you know whatever, right? And uh, you know we can all use that as a crutch. So, so that's great. Anything you want to circle back on that? <laughs> no, you know I think it's important, and I don't know if it's it's you know it touched upon enough. And it's something I say that can ruffle feathers or maybe trigger some people in that I was addicted to my depression. My depression and my anxiety and my mental illness, while it kept me in such distress and pain and chaos and crying fits and anxiety attacks, it kept me in my comfort zone. It kept me in the predictable. It kept me in what my body was used to. And so in many ways, it held me back from my healing because it said, no, that pain out there that's unknown, that we don't know what's going to happen over there let's just stay in this pain because we can predict, we know what's happening here. We know how this is going to go. It also, you know, prevented me and allowed me to not go through formative early twenties of assuming responsibility and stepping into this world and taking responsibility for my emotional state and, and, and the life that I have here. So, you know, my mental illness, while very real and very tangible and loves to visit me at times when I would prefer it to not, there was a lot of moments, and I think most of my suffering came from the fact that I allowed myself to play the victim, that I blamed the cards that I was dealt on my despair and suffering. And the minute I realized and took responsibility and accepted that these were the cards that I was dealt, I started to use my emotional landscape as my superpower. And today, you know, 10 years after being diagnosed, 16 years after having my first depressive episode, I feel wildly safe in my emotions. I think they are my biggest teachers, mentors, guides. They have helped me in business. They are the reason I am successful with Scott's agency. I also started recognizing that when I got into entrepreneurship, this game was a personal development game. It wasn't a PNL. It wasn't a you know market strategy. Those are all parts of it. But at the end of the day, successful entrepreneurs are successful because of their emotional strength and their mindset. And I yeah. saw that so many women who had the resources the education, the access to funds, not getting into the game of their dreams because of self-doubt, because of fear, because of anxiety. Yes. And that's when I kind of woke up to, whoa, my bipolar disorder primed me to walk through emotional hell to gather yes. the strength and the tools that I could then apply to living out my purpose, which is speaking, running scouts agency, writing books, et cetera. And so once I realized that it was the emotional landscape that was holding us all back from success, that's when the light bulb went off in my brain. Yeah, it's true. Our emotions, which is basically why I named this show, Transform Your Mind, Transform Your Life. Because if you believe that you can, you can. And if you have this crutch that says you were born poor or you were born black, or you were born with a mental illness, or you were born with whatever crutch that you want, and that prevents you from moving forward, then your life is not yeah. gonna be transformed. So Everyone that was- Everyone can find a crutch. Everyone can yeah. find a crutch, no matter who they are, no matter if their life is technically great on paper or technically, you know, really unfortunate circumstances. We yes. can all very easily rely on a crutch. Yes, very, very true, very, very true. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, so you, you, you transition a little bit in the second question I had here, and that is um, how can, uh, you know, entrepreneurs handle the emotional roller coaster and what kind of mindset shifts that they need in order to become a successful entrepreneur? 
Now you talked a minute ago about, um, uh, you know, um, your purpose and the fact that you, your bipolar disorder with your highs and lows allowed you to have the emotional strength of an entrepreneur. Now, entrepreneurs are, um, are, are in, in a couple of different categories. The first category is the person that does everything, whereas just you, <laughs> right? And you're doing everything. And then you can become successful where you have a team. And um, sometimes when you have a team, maybe you don't even have to show up. You know, you can be traveling and, and make your team handle it. But um, let's talk about the entrepreneur that is doing everything. What kind of advice would you give to that entrepreneur female, let's say, that, um, uh, you know, wants to start a magazine or a hair salon or something and, and has to deal with all the aspects of an entrepreneurship and the uncertainty of whether you're going to be able to pay rent because you got to sell stuff, you know? <laughs> the first is that I would really invite you to cultivate the belief that once I cultivate a change to my life, that you are safe in your emotions. Cultivate the belief that you're safe in your emotions and then accept, just wholeheartedly, unconditionally accept that uncomfortable emotions are highly part of this game, that you will survive them, that you are safe in them, and that if you can reduce the suffering above the pain, and what I mean by that is if you can limit the anxiety about the anxiety or the sadness about the depression, we can work with the root uncomfortable emotion and really understand what it's trying to tell us. I say that if you can build a beautiful Instagram, you're a social media manager. If you can create a stunning graphic on a website, you're a graphic designer. Walking through the fire with your head held high, that makes you an entrepreneur. And so before you jump into the game, Yes, you're going to be juggling all the hats. You're going to be the customer service experience. You're going to be the graphic designer. You're going to be the social media manager. You're going to be the sales. All the things that you're going to have to figure out how to do. Yes. And on top of that, you're going to have to walk through the uncomfortable discomfort that comes with that responsibility. And so know and accept that that's part of the game. My sister, uh, she started her own app called Camber and the day they released it to, for, on the beta, you know, the app wasn't working. And I reframed that for her and I said, congratulations, you've been initiated. You have your first fire, you're an entrepreneur. And so it's reframing the fires and when they come saying, yeah, I've, I've been waiting for you. I knew you were gonna come. I know this is gonna suck. Let's walk through it together. So it's really suiting up and really pulling in from your personal power and your strength. It's not, ex it's not expecting that entrepreneurship is gonna be easy and fun and glamorous and you're always in alignment and you're flowing with creative ideas and your courses are selling out with six figure launches automatically, et cetera. The fires will come more often than the successes do, it feels like at times. And so it's really one, feeling safe in your emotions Two, not adding suffering to the already painful emotion you might be experiencing by just allowing that painful emotion to be rather than judging it or increasing the anxiety about the anxiety. And three, unconditionally accepting that uncomfortable moments, challenging moments will happen whether you're an entrepreneur or not, but they really come down hard on you when you're the entrepreneur. And that those are the moments that are going to progress you forward towards your purpose. Those are the moments you're going to change, develop, transform, get stronger. And so when they come, Smile and be grateful because you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As a coach, I understand what you're trying to say, but it's a very hard pill to swallow because people go into entrepreneurship with the dream and they don't necessarily go into it. They understand it's hard work, but um, uh, it's very hard in order to, um, uh, to smile and say, I'm going to walk through the fire, like Tony Robbins, make you do the fire walk. And I'm pretty sure that's what it's setting you up for. <laughs> that you can, <laughs> you can walk through the fire and not get burnt. Um, but yeah, it's, um, and you know, I was listening to a podcast. This was actually wasn't a podcast, it was the, um, a book. I was listening to a book and um, one of um, the people that I admire and I follow, Dwayne Dwyer, and he talks about 
um, living from the end. So let's say that you become an entrepreneur for a certain end purpose or end game. When you're walking through the fire, if you can see that end, then um, it will give you the strength in order to not chuck it in and to move forward. So that's good. I love that. Uh, great, great, great um, uh, you know, um, information and inspiration for an entrepreneur. Now, um, you say that every entrepreneur should prioritize their mental health. Now, every entrepreneur is not going to have depression and bipolar, but mental health covers a gamut of things. It covers, like you talk about your emotions, it, you know, um, it, it, it covers whether you're going to let, um, uh, you know, challenges, you know, make you feel down and, or a customer, a root customer, um, or you, the shipment didn't go in or the app didn't go through or, you know, those type of things and up and down emotions. So what's your advice on that? You know, I, when I wrote The Emotional Entrepreneur, it really was not for the mentally ill. I think the beauty of the conversation about mental illness that is coming to the forefront in the last few years, you know, when I was diagnosed 10 years ago, it was like, no one's talking about this. I'm crazy. I'm done for, you know, and now the conversation is so beautifully being opened. And in the conversation about mental illness being opened, the conversation about everyone's daily mental health is being opened. And that's really the people I want to talk to. You know, all of my messages are not for those who struggle with mental illness. It's for those who have mental health, which is all of us. And I think for too long, we've been told that if we don't have a mental illness, then that's not something we get to prioritize when really our experience here on earth is based on how we relate to our emotions. And many times we act we act in spite of our emotions when our higher self knows better or our higher self would have had a different plan for us. So if you're an entrepreneur and you are listening and you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna go through fires. I'm gonna go through ups and downs. I'm gonna have to figure out if the warehouse, whatever, they messed up our product or a client's unhappy and now I gotta figure out how to make payroll and all of those things. You might as well emotionally feel safe during that process because your business is going to soar if you are emotionally sound and strong within. And so I have a plethora of tips on how to do this in the book from putting your phone away and actually unplugging from your business and just going in here, being with you, taking time to walk outside without your shoes and connect to the earth, uh, having morning routines, meditating, uh, nourishing rest versus numbing out. So, you know, I think that sometimes as entrepreneurs and as everyone, I'm sure everyone can relate to this, You've had a tough week, your nine to five's killing you, and you go and you binge Netflix for 10 hours and you don't even know what happened to your night, right? That's actually not resting. That's actually creating increased stimula stimulation that's not filling your cup up. So I really talk about carving out five, 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever minutes you can in the day, depending on if you're a parent or if you're still your nine to five working your side hustle, you know, to engage in nourishing rest that fills your cup up. Because when you go into team calls with a sense of security and foundation and connection, you're going to approach all of your meetings, all of your deals, everything you go throughout the day with, people are going to be attracted to you more. And if people are attracted to you more, your business is going to grow. Take the used car salesman anecdote, which I think I talk about in the book. Nobody wants to buy from the used car salesman who is hounding and desperate and like anxious and just wants to make a deal for survival, right? No one wants to buy a car from that guy. Everybody wants to buy a car from the guy who's cool, calm, collected, confident, detached, really believes in his product, but has no real control over you and what he wants or she wants the situation to be. So when you're good, the external world responds to you better. When the external world responds to you better, your business grows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, um, I want to add to that. Um, uh, again, I was listening to Dr. Dwayne Wire this morning, and he was talking about making sure you're feeling good. So that's one of the things that you're talking about here. If you're feeling good, then everybody that's um, around you would also feel good. And if you show up being, you know, uh, this crazy person that, you know, it's a bitch and ye yelling at people because you're in a bad space, then that is the atmosphere you're going to have. Um, and yeah, and I'm glad you're saying that, yeah, mental health is not, 
is not necessary for you know people that's been diagnosed with something, but it's very important to um, to keep your mental health and. And a lot of people do that by trying to feel good, whether it's by gratitude meditation, whether I like the one about, um, I don't do it very often, but I know about, you know, walking um, on the grass and connecting to Mother, Asia, Mother Nature. Um, but yeah, I, I walk in the park every day and commune with the trees. And that's part of my mental health and, me and meditate. You know, that's my, my part of me keeping myself um, and my mental health and my gratitude and all the things um, at the top so that I can feel good. Because once you get those emotions and making you feel bad, then it just is a domino effect and everything goes down the, goes down the, the drain. So um, one of the things um, that I, I love about your bio is that you talk about your prescription medley and, and, and whatever. So for the people that have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Can you share your journey? Um, I know that you still struggle with it a little bit now. I don't know if it comes as often as it used to, but talk to them about hope for this illness, right? So actually this month celebrates one year being psychiatry medication free. And I don't say that to promote the stigma or to promote anyone to go off their medication. I simply say because medication got me to a point where I was able to go off and then flourish in my life. And there were a lot of dark moments with me and my trial and error for medication. So if anyone is listening to this and is considering medication for a mental illness diagnosis, a mental health diagnosis, and is feeling shame around that, I really invite you to end that shame and end that stigma. You know, there are times in our lives where we need to take things to physically and mentally treat our, our illnesses and our bodies and our spirits and our souls, et cetera. And so um, I never felt shame around taking the psychiatric medication. And I wish someone had told me, given me a couple tips before I jumped into that journey, which is one, um, medication really, in my opinion, this is a very loose number, can do 10 to 20% of your healing for you. And you really need to show up for that 80, 90%. And so while the medication is working, because it could take three months to even take effect, I really invite you to not passively wait for medication to come save your mental state, but to really recognize that it's just a little boost and the rest you really have to show up for. So reframing this idea that medication is going to heal you completely, um, it, for me was very helpful because I wasn't just passively playing the victim and waiting for something else to take over me and heal me. So medication really does a very small percentage of your healing for you. It can provide that launching pad, but uh, really get ready for yourself to show up for you. Two, I would say to really be your own advocate in the psychiatry office. Uh, ask about the symptoms. Ask about what's coming off the medication. Like, are there withdrawals? Do I have to, to you know, ease off for two months? And I say this because I was put on a medication where I was not given the correct information about the withdrawals and I withdrawed for a month, even though I went off it the right way. And it was a really traumatic experience for me. So um, really ask about the side effects, ask about, you know, if I experience what side effects, if I experience in a couple of weeks, do I need to call you and stop going on it? Just really, really be thorough with what you're putting in your body because people have different reactions. And sometimes psychiatrists, not all, but sometimes they can prescribe and not necessarily give you the in-depth download. So, really be your own advocate and understand the symptoms and the side effects of each medication you're going on. And while it's a beautiful thing to have that support and help as you walk down your mental health journey, uh, really place a lot of emphasis on what you can do today while you wait for a medication to take effect. Okay, um, I have a circle back on that. So you're saying that the medication only helps you 10 to 20%. But let's say that you're depressed. You're depressed mm -hmm. where you can't get up out of bed in the morning, which is, you know, depression. And you're taking this medication. Um, what is it going to do for you with 10%? Is it going to make you get up out of bed? Is it going to make you feel better during the day? What does it do specifically? I can't comment on that because that's a very specific, like everyone is so different depending on their mental illness and then the med they take, you know, for some people, yeah, it can help them get out of bed. And then they're like, whoa, I have to heal everything else for me to function in this world. Other people, it's just a little bit of a boost where the anxiety kind of gets a little bit, you know, the edge comes off. 
it's such a personalized practice with psychiatric medication. And that's why I like to preach really focusing on what's in your control and what you can do today, just because there's no guarantees with how the medication is going to help you. You might have to try a few before you get the one that's going to work too. So while I believe that they are so helpful, I also really believe I'm placing the emphasis while you're going through your trial and error journey with medication, sometimes the first one works, uh, really doubling down on self-care practices and healing your mind as well. Okay. All right. Okay. That makes sense. So yeah, we've got to figure out, you know, if the, if it gives you the boost just to get up out of bed um, and not feel like you want to die, then um, you've been, I'm pretty sure your doctor gives you some other ideas that are, if he's a good psychiatrist that would help you to cope. You know what yeah. I mean? I remember, I remember, you know, she never um, took any medication, but my, my daughter had a, um, a depressive episode when her fiance committed suicide and she would call me and she would say, Hey, you know, um, it's not getting any better. She thought that as time went on, you know, it would get better for her to go through the day. And she was saying, Hey, it's not getting any better, but you know, obviously it did. But when you, when you're going through that, it's, it's, it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to go through it. Okay. Yeah, All right. Tough. What was that? That's so tough. I'm sending her love. That's, that's really hard. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. All right. So we're at the point right now. So can you tell us about your book, The Emotional Entrepreneur? You gave us a little tidbit a minute ago. Um, now you can expand on it. What do you want? You said it was not written for people that has been diagnosed specifically with mental illness, but so that they, people can, you know, prioritize mental illness for the people that are mentally, you know, that have mental health. I like that play on words. So what do you want the readers to walk away after reading your book? Yes. So the emotional entrepreneur is really the emotional guidebook for entrepreneurship. So if you are someone who wants to start an agency, a podcast, a product-based business, a life coaching, you know, career, et cetera, you might be purchasing books on how to manage clients. You might be purchasing books on how to hit six figures. You might be purchasing books on uh, how to close more sales deals, et cetera, how to brand your website. This is the emotional part of all of that. This is going to be your guidebook towards navigating fear, combating imposter syndrome, enjoying yourself along the way by celebrating small wins and believing in yourself. It's going to help you reframe your relationship to your anxiety as you get started. It's going to make you understand that entrepreneurship and starting your own business is the biggest personal development game and you get to be emotionally supported in that. And so it really is. There's 25 lessons. I have it right here, 25 lessons, and you can read it through straightforward. It will teach you all the things. I recommend reading the whole thing through once. And then on the mornings you wake up and you're dealing with a scarcity mindset when it comes to money, you can just open that chapter, that lesson, and read through that and get that extra support. Or if you're having anxiety around a client call or you know a manufacturer order gone wrong, you can open the book and read the anxiety lesson and get support there. So it is really meant to be kind of a resource that you go back to as you pursue the business of your dreams. I love it. I love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because yes, you product based or service based or anything, even if you're selling a widget. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of things that goes into the business. So I'm mm -hmm. glad that you are um, addressing the mental health because you're right. That definitely should be a priority because if you feel good, and you're in a good place, you're going to, you're going to be much more successful because when we feel good and when we have our emotions in check, then we're not going to be stressed and, you know, and we're going to enjoy our business. Um, and you'll be, you'll be much more successful. So, so that's pretty good. I love that. All right. And, um, um, how can those, um, uh, listening and watching on TV connect with you on social media, get a copy of your book, that kind of thing. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Scout Sobel. That's the best place to connect with me. In my uh, bio, there's links to Scout's Agency, my podcast, and you can buy the book there. Or you can just search The Emotional Entrepreneur Scout Sobel on Amazon and get the book there as well. Awesome. So you have a podcast? Yes, I have OKSIS Podcast, which I co-host with my sister. And then I have Scout Podcast, which are shorts. Uh, solo episode ramblings that I talk about the intersection of mental health and entrepreneurship. 
Okay, perfect. All right. So, yeah. So, um, great interview. Um, uh, I'm always um, amazed when uh, you know my my when my guests are so verbally. <laughs> I mean, you came on strong, and so I, I probably should have guessed. I thought that maybe you had you were a guest on a lot of podcasts, but you know, our dialogue was was crips and and to the point and. Um, um, a very good interviewer. So I love it. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So, you know, um, uh, for, you know, for our, our new listeners and our regular listeners know that a copy of the transcript of my conversation with Scout is going to be on the, my blog, which is the show page, a blog that myhelps.us. And on there would be the links to um, her book, The Emotional Entrepreneur, um, I will get your um, team member to send me the links to your podcast. And, um, and of course, yeah, I'll connect with you on um, Instagram and tag you when um, the episode is live. And um, so you can definitely share it. But yeah, um, you know, this was a really good conversation. We touched on, on everything. We touched on mental illness. We touched on mental health. We touched on um, uh, the emotional roller coaster of entrepreneurs. Um, uh, yeah, we 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 touched on you know when you're the medication. Whether you know, um, I love what Scout said that a lot of people do feel shame that they have to be on medication, and. Um, and there's no shame in that. You just you just need help, right? And sooner or later, um, if you do your 80%, then you'll be able to come off of it. And that's a beautiful thing when you know that you're not using it as a crutch anymore. And um, you know, one of my one of my biggest um, takeaways about um, depression was reading um, uh, the book The Work. And that was with Byron Katie. I mean, I have never actually heard of uh, a depression that she like she went through. I don't know if you know her story, but she said that she was so depressed that she had to put herself in a halfway house and she laid on the floor, you know, and couldn't get up and couldn't move until one day she decided to change her inner dialogue and change um, her mindset. Not necessarily change her mindset change what she said to herself because that yeah. is that is the biggest part do you know her work uh, i am familiar i'm not an expert i i have listened to her on podcasts and and i'm such yeah. a that's fan. where i was introduced to her yeah. and then i read her book right go ahead mm -hmm. yeah just uh just questioning your thoughts you know i think is so important after my book launch i was exhausted so exhausted and so burnt out that my thoughts kept telling me that I didn't want my business. I didn't want my book. I didn't want this career path anymore, all these things. And I was able to identify, no, those aren't true. Those are thoughts that are coming up because I'm physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally exhausted. And so my thoughts are trying to get me away from anything that will further that burnout phase. And so I was able to express those thoughts while knowing that they aren't true. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the thoughts are, you know, very good. So yes, mental illness is, is something very important that we need to prioritize. Um, uh, so very good conversation. Um, I want to, I want to thank Scout for coming on and giving such a perfect interview <laughs> for sharing so eloquently. And um, uh, yeah, so as we wrap up, um, I want to thank you guys all for tuning in to the Transform Your Mind to Transform Your Life radio podcast and television show. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify or any of those places that you can subscribe and rate and review, please do. I bring guests like Scout every week that will help you to transform your mind because if you don't transform your mind, you will never get to the end that you envision and that you want. So you design your life with your thoughts. You're, you know, um, Scout was telling you, you know, shared with us that um, she had some challenges. Um, but still, she designed her life, she's successful, she worked with those challenges, and she stopped letting her mental illness be a crutch. So you can do the same thing too. So um, I want to definitely thank you guys for tuning in. And um, uh, before we end the recording, um, Scout, any last words? No, I'm just so appreciative to talk with you. It's been such a pleasure. I love 
talking with other women who get this type of work and who are interested in helping other people just break through limiting beliefs and uncomfortable emotions to really live out their dream life. And I think that 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 phrase or that idea has become cheesy, but I think you and I are living proof that it really is true and it works. Yes, for sure. Awesome. Well, listen, thanks again, guys. Thanks, Scout, for an excellent interview. Thank you all for tuning in. And until next time, blessings.